have in the ocean. Um, but I'd like to get started with our panel right now. And the first one is um, James Barnes. And it was great meeting you because we Skyped and uh, spoke to each other um, for a very long time um, over the telephone or over the Skype. And he is the executive director of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition. And he is very interested in saving and protecting the Ross Sea. So please join him. Thank you. Jim. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, just a couple of minutes of quick background because I know we have to run fast. I'm going to try to tell you a story about a large area. It's about 647,000 square kilometers. Uh, it's, in a, about the far, it's about as far away on this earth as you can get from here, the Ross Sea. It's one of Sylvia's hope spots. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, there's real hope for this hope spot, which I'll try to cover in a, just a short number of minutes. Uh, our coalition was formed originally in 1978-79, at a time when the oil companies and gas companies were thinking about trying to open up Antarctica for exploitation. Uh, with Greenpeace and WWF and other of my coalition members, we led a campaign for 10 years to stop that. And in 1989, when Australia and France both agreed not to go along with this minerals convention, it was called, uh, we could turn the corner towards a more uh, uh, hopeful uh, alternative, which ended up being the, the environmental, excuse me, <coughs> the environmental protocol. Let me see if I can take this out of here. Maybe not environmental protocol to the Antarctic Treaty. That was signed in 1991 and it has a virtually permanent mining ban in it along with a lot of other uh, cool environmental protection uh, procedures. So we've been doing this for a long time. We have 27 full members around the world and ASOC has the only NGO environmental seat at the table of the Antarctic Treaty System and I'll get into that just a little bit. Can I take this microphone out of this thing? Good technological. <clears throat> Does it come out? We're going to need some guidance here. I'll just pull it out. Oh, I got it. Okay. So, a lot of us are trying to think of the way to describe in simple words what this place is. And this is a phrase that my filmmaker friend from New Zealand, Peter Young, and John Weller, a great photographer, you're going to see a lot of his images today came up with the last ocean. Why do we call it the last ocean? Well, we do that because we think it's going to be the last wild ocean on Earth, the way things are going. I hope that's not, in, at the end of the day, true. In any event, it's going to be uh, an important, if not the, the last ocean. And so that's our kind of touch phrase that we're using for it. Here's where it is. This is a map of Antarctica. You see at the var very bottom of your screen, that's the Ross Sea. The U.S. McMurdo Station, the biggest scientific station, is down there on the edge of this Ross Sea. Um, so you can see it's a very, very long way away. Uh, this is a more close-up map <coughs> of the Ross Sea continental shelf and slope. And it's the largest stretch of continental shelf in the Southern Ocean. And as I mentioned, it's 647,000 square kilometers, or about 2% uh, of the Southern Ocean. And our goal is to have this become a no-take uh, marine reserve, or MPA, and I'm going to explain a little bit about how we're going to do that and what the timeline is. Um, the starting point for this discussion is that no one owns Antarctica. I know some of you think you've heard people claim it. Yeah, there's seven countries that claim, but those claims are not recognized by anybody else. And so all the oceans around Antarctica is high seas. So this is part of a high seas initiative that many organizations uh, here and elsewhere are involved with, including ASOC. Um, in 1982, the governments that control uh, the governance of the region <coughs> created a convention. I'm not going to read out the whole name. I'll just say it's CAMELAR. It oversees fishing and conservation in the Antarctic, the Southern Ocean. And after maybe five or six years of discussions with the scientists and the policymakers in several governments, and the U.S. was a leader in this, uh, I congratulate them for that, they agreed to start deliberating how to create an MPA network in the Southern Ocean. And this was, uh, there's two parts to the Antarctic Treaty System, the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Parties uh, being the other part. They endorsed this proposal in 2008, 2009, and they agreed on a target date 
of November 2012 to try to get the initial uh, network up and running. Last year at their meeting in uh, November uh, in Hobart, uh, they set the first one up. It's around the, around the South Orkney Islands. It's about 1% of the Southern Ocean. So that was a good step forward. Ten more to go. Um, and the Ross Sea is one of their priority areas. A few facts about what's so special about the wildlife in uh, the Ross Sea. Those are some numbers. I, I think I'll read them all out. But 38% of all the Adelie penguins in the world, 26% of uh, all the emperor penguins, and so forth. It's a very, very robust upper trophic, trophic level ecosystem. And um, according to uh, a major global study in 2008 of human impacts on the world's oceans, Ross Sea was picked to be the least affected large uh, continental shelf ecosystem left on Earth. And we hope it stays that way. Um, the state of the Ross Sea food web is more or less compatible to what it's been for millennia, except for a couple of things. The loss of blue, and some people say sperm, but that's a debatable point, but I put it there anyway, because one of the scientists wanted me to. Now recovering very slowly. Those blues were taken out in the 1920s and 30s for the most part. And then starting in 1997, a toothfish fishery started. And that's one of the things that most worries us. It's grown very quickly. The toothfish is the largest predator fish in the Antarctic. It's like a shark. There aren't sharks in the Antarctic. It serves the function of a shark. And I'll show you some pictures. Here's one right here, D. Mahsoni. Um, this is the McMurdo Sound near where the McMurdo Base is in the Ross Sea. And these are just some of the many fish there. But these are drawn to scale. And the toothfish is a big, a big boy. Um, as I said, it forms the, uh, it fulfills the function of a shark in the ecosystem. Now, what has the Ross Sea not experienced, unlike a lot of other places? No anoxic dead zones, no red tides, no invasions of jellyfish, no mysterious fish die-offs, et cetera, um, and no mineral act activity because we blocked that off 20 years ago. <coughs> um, it's a very pristine place. It has another characteristic which we're touting, especially this year. We write a paper every year for the Antarctic Treaty meeting. Our paper this year on the Ross Sea is its role as a climate reference zone. And that's because from the uh, IPCC projections, the Ross Sea likely will be the last uh, big ocean on Earth that will be able to embrace a cryopelagic uh, community in its original way. And it'll be a refuge, actually, a refugium. That's one of the words that we sometimes use. But for the purposes of the paper this year, we wanted to stress that it can be <clears throat> an un unparalleled climate reference zone, reference area. And the, we're trying to make the, what I call the science case for protecting the Ross Sea. So we have like five or six different pillars to it. The climate pillar is one of them and very important. So what about the politics? Uh, the US is a key player. Uh, but it's only one of uh, more than 20 countries. And we've been working on the U.S. for now about a year uh, to see if we can convince them to be a leader in obtaining a no-take MPA for the Ross Sea. We need a champion. You're, you don't win any of these things in the international realm without champions. And uh, the U.S. has uh, done most of the science in the Ross Sea. It has a long track record because of the base, the McMurdo base there. Uh, but as, a, as we speak today, it still does not know what its position is. In the last couple of months, we've had lots of meetings at the State Department and NOAA. Uh, we've written high-level policy letters to Hillary Clinton and Jane Lubchenco and so forth. Uh, I think it's moving in the right direction. Anything you guys can do to help uh, promote a strong U.S. leadership position, thank you in advance for that. Um, if, if we don't have uh, I think more help at all levels, citizens writing letters, uh, whatever high-level contacts you have and can employ, uh, then I'm not certain we will come to the conclusion that, that I want and I think all of us in this room want. Um, it's a complicated equation because uh, some countries led by New Zealand and South Korea are fishing for these big toothfish and they don't want to stop. And so that's the key political question uh, before us. There's six countries, I think, all together fishing, but the New Zealanders and the South Koreans take most of it. Who eats this fish? We do. Americans import an estimated 80% of all the Ross Sea toothfish caught. It's not called Ross Sea toothfish. You have to look 
uh, closely and see what it is. But normally it's called Chilean sea bass. On some, in some stores, uh, and I think John's going to talk with us a little bit. Is this right? Maybe. Okay. Um, it'll be a footnote almost to the Chilean. Oh, this is Rossi toothfish. But a lot of times you can't even tell, you know, where it's from. But we, as the U.S. consumers, are eating most of this Rossi toothfish, which supports the uh, political position, if you will, of the South Koreas, the New Zealands, uh, the Japans, and so forth of the world. So that's another tool uh, that we have. And now I just want to show you some images. Uh, oh, no, the last. Uh, we put out a global science petition <coughs> last year. Um, you can't read the whole thing. I just wanted to put the text up. But we have so far almost 500 scientists around the world who have signed on to this, including most of the scientists who have done serious Ross Sea work around the world. And Sylvia was the first signatory. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, and uh, Claire Christian, Claire, will you wave for people who runs our office in DC, uh, has a copy of the petition here. Anybody who's a master's or PhD scientist and who wants to sign on to this, it's a growing global petition and we're still figuring out how to use it best uh, as we go along, but we're gonna probably table it at the annual Camelar meeting in November this year. And we were hoping for a thousand signatures, I think, but we're, maybe we'll get there. We need, need your help on that. Now let's see some, uh, oh, here's two key websites. That's our website, and this other one is www.lastocean.co.newzealand, and that's our colleagues who are making the film, The Last Ocean. It's a wonderful website. Anything you ever want to know about the Ross Sea, you will learn from this website. Huh? Who lives? Uh, John Weller, who took these pictures, I'm going to show you, lives in Boulder. Another so, Colorado. So I'm just going to run through some of the, so John is a fantastic photographer, he's a Pew Fellow for his photography and he just gets some of the most amazing images that, uh, that I've ever seen. Oh, take the lights down, who's in charge of the lights? Sorry. <laughs> Shall I wait? I guess the control panel's far away. Okay, that's better. By the way, the species of killer whale, just a couple of years ago, they determined it's a special species. It's not like killer whales elsewhere. Now it's called the Ross Sea killer whale. John's an underwater photographer, too. And this is not his picture, uh, taken by another photographer, but this is a leopard seal eating a toothfish. So I always like to end up with that shot. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, if you go to Whole Foods, you can find uh, some, some toothfish there. And the last time I did go, I asked about that. And they said, oh, it's okay, it's been MSC certified. And so I sent that note to Jim, and maybe John might have an opportunity to discuss that um, before you wrap up. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Sylvia Earle, who is the explorer in residence at the National Geographic. But this is my favorite title. I kind of think when I grow up, I really want to be in the same category as her, but I don't think I ever could, but the ambassador to the world's ocean. And even more importantly, her deepness. Please join us. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thanks for all of you coming in on this sunny day to dive into some really great issues. I think that 
it's really important to think about how do we take care of the natural systems that take care of us. We've taken all of this for granted through most of our history as a species. The air we breathe, the water that magically falls out of the sky, the fabric of life that coats the land and fills the ocean. But on our watch, during our time, we have discovered what none of our predecessors were able to see because we didn't have enough information gathered together. We hadn't yet connected the dots. We didn't have satellites up in the sky nor submersibles down deep in the sea or people communicating all over the world almost simultaneously about the news of what's happening. Enough had not occurred on the land, in the sky, and in the sea to be able to understand that humans have the capacity to change the nature of nature. Ed Wilson, actually on his 80th birthday a couple of years ago at a big party in New York, commented that he was concerned that in his lifetime he could see nature letting us no, the other way around is that we were letting nature, we are letting nature slip through our fingers. But the flip side of that is that nature could let us slip through her fingers. Think of that. Most of the panel this morning, some of the, con the just before, um, not the first panel, but the next one, talking about the economic values and how do you measure the value of the ocean. Well, when you think the way Ed Wilson was phrasing it, was crafting it, the, the ocean, actually nature broadly, but especially the ocean, keeps us alive. It's our life support system. Do you like to live? Do you like to breathe? If you do, you better like the ocean, and you better put it on the balance sheet. Because in our time, mostly in the last 50 years, but even in the last 25, the last 10, the last five, the pace is picking up, both in terms of what we know, but also what we understand. And we're sharing time with creatures such as the toothfish, such as seals, such as the bowhead whales that may live to be two centuries old. Perhaps some of the orange ruffy can live that long as well. They have experienced a time since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Some corals, of course, go back much longer than that, 2,000 years, even more. They certainly have experienced change, but however smart they are, the dolphins are pretty sharp, no question about it, and other creatures as well. But they don't know why the changes are taking place. <laughs> we do, and they don't know what to do about it. We do. We now know, first of all, we've got a problem, and secondly, we have some ideas about what to do concerning those problems. So marine protected areas, for me, there's just one big blue candidate. It's called the ocean. That's the marine protected area that we should be thinking about because it keeps us alive. It is the blue heart of the planet. So think about it. How much of your heart do you want to protect? Do you want to have a little network of protected areas? in your heart to keep you alive? I think it may sound a little radical given what we're currently expecting the ocean to deliver to us that really represents extraction from the systems that keep us alive. We've been drawing down the assets through the history of our species, but now for the very first time, we really are beginning to see that there's a price to pay. We see it in terms of the excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We see it in terms of the pollution in the ocean. We see it in terms of the depletion of wildlife on the land and now in the sea as well. With consequences back to something far more fundamental than pounds of meat that we can sell extracted from the sea. Far more than barrels of oil that we can extract from the ocean, far more valuable because what is your life support system worth? For the first time, we can understand the horizon ahead of us and our future at risk 
because of what we've done in the past. In some ways, we're the planet's worst nightmare, but in others, the best hope. Because we're the only ones who have the power to take what we know and apply it to protect what keeps us alive. In all of the solar system, in all of the universe, as far as we know, this is it, this little blue speck that we have used and used and used. Like any other creature, we all use the world around us, whether you're an earthworm or a polar bear or a human being. But we have an enhanced capacity now with nearly seven billion of us. Going back to 1800, there were only one billion. And going forward, there looks like there will be more occupying this same blue space in the universe. And we can only achieve success if we get serious about taking care of the natural systems that take care of us. So, so, so far in the ocean, mirroring what was done on the land, of course, with the national parks and protected areas that preceded the present time, starting mostly in the early 20th century. Now we're looking at starting still early in the 21st, but we have to speed up the process, both on the land and in the, in the ocean. And as you just heard about Antarctica, the high seas, 64% of the ocean is high seas, that area where essentially anything still goes. And I, I, I will quote Charles Clover, the guy who wrote The End of the Line, who said, we've allowed the fishermen to steal the ocean. We've allowed them to claim the ocean as theirs. Why do we do that? Why do we say, okay, go take the toothfish, it's all right with us, or in the Gulf of Mexico to trawl the ocean floor, or in the North Sea, or wherever it is, that if you think about it, it doesn't make sense that that's the best and highest use of the elements of what makes the ocean function. Well, much more of this, I hope, in the discussion. Now, yes, we can probably get away with eating some fish, but not on the scale that we're currently consuming and not using the techniques that we're consuming if, in fact, we are to see an ocean that will work going forward. So, in 2009, when I had a chance to articulate a wish of what, if I could make a wish big enough to change the world, what would it be? My response to that was pretty easy. Cramming my, my thoughts to the world in 18 minutes for the TED talk in Long Beach, California, that was tricky. But I did my best to say in that little chunk of time why I think that it is important to embrace the ocean, to really try to ignite public support behind marine protected areas and a campaign of public support in terms of understanding that the ocean counts, that the ocean is our life support system. People rallied around, had lots of response to that wish. And one of the responses was to have an expedition that took place about this time last year, actually early April of 2010. And some of you here in this room were aboard for that expedition. Wolcott, where are you? I know you're here somewhere, there you are. <laughs> and, uh, and others, but the idea that if you could get 100 people together, take them out and take them to a good wet blue place and stir them up a little bit, inspire them with some lofty presentations by brainy people and some who are of artistic inclinations such as Jim Toomey, where are you? <laughs> somewhere here, <laughs> Mr. Shark. Um, and come away with an idea, some ideas about where do we go from here? How do we take care of the ocean? Places such as the high seas, the Sargasso Sea, like, like Antarctica is in the high seas. It's a big chunk of the Atlantic Ocean. And it is beyond the jurisdiction of most nations, Bermuda being the exception that has an edge of the Sargasso Sea within its exclusive economic zone. The heart of the Pacific, the, the Coral Triangle, the Coral Sea along the coast of of Australia. I mean, if you have to choose a, a series of places that will cause hope, hope spots, if you will, if they can be embraced, if we can protect them, it does provide hope for the ocean and therefore hope for us. I want to share just a little five-minute clip, four and a half minutes, whatever, to end my opening remarks here 
uh, it is part of the response to the wish. An individual said, well, I think what we should do is make a film about this whole project. And the expedition was called Mission Blue. The film will be called Mission Blue. We have an initiative that is anchored at the National Geographic called Mission Blue. It aspires to do some of the things that you heard about this morning from Greg McGillivray, a public campaign of support to get films, to get an initiative to protect the blue heart of the planet, for heaven's sakes. So the film, if we could just look at that clip right now, please. I hope it's geared and ready to go. There it is. Fifty years ago, when I began exploring the ocean, it seemed at that time to be a sea of Eden. But now we know, we are now facing paradise lost. This trip is absolutely brand new for Ted. We've never done anything like it before. The trip came about because of a wish that Ted granted Sylvia Earle. I hope for your help to explore and protect the wild ocean in ways that will restore the health and, in so doing, secure hope for humankind. Sylvia Earle has devoted her life to this passion of the oceans. And the need for knowledge about all aspects of the environment, whether on the land or on the sea. I've always been a scientist. I am a scientist. But I've been transformed in part, I suppose, by having children and seeing that the places I knew as a child, I can't take them because they're gone. The trip is a bet that if you bring together a group of really remarkable people who are well resourced, some of the world's greatest marine scientists, some of the world's great storytellers, you put them together and you show them what's happening in the oceans. Something incredible is going to happen. I was raised with a great respect for nature, but I never added the ocean to that. And to be able to be in a place like the Galapagos, to actually get into the water and see some of the creatures that we're talking about has changed my life. Getting people to not only understand intellectually, but to know their hearts. And we're so changing the way the world works that our future is at risk. The type of fishing going on today is really wiping bluefin ecologically off the planet. Whale meat being sold in these markets was really dolphin meat, and it was toxic. There's uh, around 100 million sharks caught every year, so this is a, a truly global problem. We're literally sucking like a straw life right out of this planet. And so the idea of hope spots, the idea of protected areas is like, whoa, you know? But it's got to be big, and it's got to be real, and you got to have people with guns out there to protect it because it sure as hell isn't going to be protected by wishful thinking or let's all go off and sing Gumbaya. But if we wait another 50 years or even another 10 years, things we can do now will be gone. There is no more tomorrow that we can avoid confronting. Has declared a state of emergency because of the spill. What's at stake for the environment as the oil begins to touch land? And to me, crude oil ain't nothing but the devil. Man is destroying the planet. Just like the Bible says. In greed and time, you will destroy your own earth, and that's what's happening. In Mississippi are trying to gauge the impact of the spill as it starts to spread into the prime habitat of the biggest fish in the Gulf. So these animals are here to feed during this time, and this oil spill is right in their backyard. The terror on death row. If for nothing else good comes of this major spill, it may be to wake up people to say we have to protect the Gulf. There are real issues here of money and power. It's life itself that the ocean is delivering. And we have been abusing the ocean. We haven't been caring for the ocean. Why don't we write to 100 world leaders? There must be some place where these forests of unique creatures can be safe. And Sylvia's timing is perfect. This is that moment. The government is on board. 
And this bill is not only, we've heard it's the first in the United States, this is the first in the world. We're 100 miles offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. On corals, you're just looking at brown, gunky stuff. A great grand finale for this version of the Alvin. We need every bit of insight that we can muster. The ocean is alive. Without the ocean, life on Earth simply would not exist. I do not want to envision a world for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren that doesn't have orcas, that doesn't have hammerhead sharks, because we're all connected. I'm here because Sylvia Earle is one of the most remarkable women on Earth. She's the real thing. She's a person who has committed herself and everything that that commitment implies. And we need more of that. We have the capacity to protect the systems that keep us alive. We still have a chance, but now is the time. So one of the artists who was aboard this expedition was Jackson Brown. He started writing a song while he was there. He finished it last fall. One of the lines in the song is, if I could be anywhere in time, it would be now. It would be now. The reason being, as never before, have we known our capacity to destroy or why it matters to us. Maybe as never again will we have as good a chance as we do on our watch. Now, is the time. Thank you.